you are again. That's the way it happens. This morning I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story. The setting is the Kansas River Valley. From where the Smoky Hill River, which is right out here, meets the Republican and stretches some 110 miles eastward to Kansas City where it meets the Missouri. That's the setting for this story. There's another setting that you will hear also, but the core of the story is in this watershed, primarily the Kansas River Valley from Manhattan to Kansas City. The story is about a world of agrarian people in spirit and practice, farmers up and down the valley, how they had everything working for them, and their relationship to the towns and cities up and down from Manhattan, Walmigo, St. Mary's, Topeka, Lawrence, Bonner Springs, Kansas City, and more. In that, along that valley, Kansas State at Manhattan, Washburn at Topeka, KU, Topeka, the capital. Here is a story of towns, universities, the capital, a major, major highway from coast to coast. And I will, in the telling of that story, hope you will remember that I have said early in this talk that change may be coming and in some unexpected quarters but it's going to require a serious engagement and a transformation. The beginning of the story. Strawberries, asparagus, rhubarb, blackberries, Bluegrass pasture, potatoes, tomatoes, radishes, table beets, peas, onions, parsnips, sugar beets, carrots, sweet clover, oats, alfalfa, field corn, cucumbers, popcorn. Ten head of livestock were on the pasture, which included horses and mules, two milk cows. Confined elsewhere but eating plant products were hogs and chickens. Farm records show all of this within 500 yards of my first breath that June in 1936. The records from that period on this particular year, 25 different plots, and the data arranged across and down the, the plot, the plot size, the crop, the yield, the water applied, the kilowatt hours, the operating cost and the cost per acre. And then that is for all of the plots. Asparagus yield 10,226 plants. Asterisk yield extrapolated from 0 0.1 acre. Water applied depth and interest 4.86. Kilowatt hours, 14. Operating cost, 0.55 cents. Cost per acre, $1.49. Plot number nine, quarter of an acre. Peppers, yield, none. Water depth, 3.36. Q 
kilowatt hours, seven. Operating costs, 27 cents. Cost per acre, a dollar eight. And so on. And then a narrative about each one of the plots. And I'll just mention one. There were, was some, there were three quarters of an acre of old strawberries in this plot on June 28th. Eight and a quarter inches of water were put on two-tenths of an acre of this plot to loosen the ground so it could be plowed. On July 18, 10 and three-quarter inches of water was applied to the entire plot to loosen up the ground. This gave an average of 13.7 inches for the plot. The cost was $2.77. Picking started May 15 and ended the first week in June. The yield was poor, only 20 six crates per harvest. And so it went. That's the farm I grew up on. And in retrospect, I sometimes think that the idea for the Sunshine Farm must have come out of this sort of um, activity that was on that farm in the Kansas River Valley within three miles of Topeka. Now, those 20, those 20 crops had weed competitors that had to be destroyed using human and draft animals and therefore sun-powered labor. A human muscle-powered wheel hoe would destroy weeds between rows. A handheld hoe was used for those within rows. Fence line weeds accommodated quail. There was more than quail in that fence row. Now and then a young pullet would steal out, go feral, build her nest, lay her eggs, and hatch and raise her chicks, who in turn became wild like the mother. What became of them? Chicken hawks maybe got them. Besides the homestead's yard, trees, shrubs, and flowers, and adjacent property, there was a woodlot with squirrels. A few trees were on Old Soldier Creek, which bounded our property on the north. In 1936, the Dust Bowl is already famous, the headline version farther west. The Soil Conservation Service is a year old. Roosevelt is president. Hitler is in Europe. The entire country is in the middle period of the Great Depression. Numerous farmers were out west have abandoned their farms, but not the valley farmers. Lots of people in fields, along with crop and animal diversity, unimaginable today. Diversity was nearly everywhere with the farmers growing food for Junction City, Manhattan, Walmago, St. Mary's, Rossville, Silver Lake, Perry, Lawrence, Tonganoxie, Bonner Springs, Kansas City, and more. It was local, largely but not completely organic, fried chicken in the summer, the fattening steer and the butcher hog in the fall and winter, the rendering of lard and the making of lye soap for the weekly Monday morning wash day, People ate what was in season, summer produce was canned. The farm required countless hours of hoeing, often with a small crew. We sharpened our hoes in the morning and touched them up now and then, usually while resting at the end of a row, and at noon sharpened them up again. To be efficient, there was a right way to properly file a hoe and only a few right ways to attack the weeds. A certain amount of character was on the line, <laughs> and it didn't take long to get it right. Nearly everyone was more or less, as we put it, in the same boat. And by that we meant economically. In the early 40s, the war, meaning World War II, was on our minds. I was old enough, but I don't remember Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. I do remember the rationing and the stamps and the highway signs that said, to save tires, drive under 35. Years later, I would see a poster showing a picture of Hitler 
ghost-like next to the driver in the, in, in the car with the caption, when you drive alone, you ride with Hitler. <laughs> we had it around here for years. It must be somewhere. If anybody comes up with it, let me know. So, my two older brothers were in the Pacific, not to return until January 1, 1946. They came through the Golden Gate together, but were separated and then joined again in Denver. They all came home on a plane on that first day of the year. While they were gone, a steel-wheeled 9N Ford tractor arrived to replace the horses and mules. A gas-powered Planet Junior cultivator replaced the wheel hoe. Fossil fuel was now available to help kill weeds. Planting, hoeing, and harvest continued a while after the war. But by the mid-50s, our summer roadside market, formally displaying our fruits and vegetables along Highway 24 and 40, three miles from Topeka, stood vacant. We carried our produce across the river. Middlemen bought the produce and delivered it to the various neighborhood grocers. But that, too, was on its way out. 1951, the flood and the U.S. Corps of Engineers. The 51 flood was higher than in 1903. Our farm was on the second bench, but even so, the flood water ran a few inches deep across the floor of the barn and the house. The crest came on Friday, the 13th of July. But when the river went back, returned to its banks, there was a stench throughout the valley. Wheat straw draped the fences. Many livestock had been hauled to the hills, but many had been stranded and many drowned. The hill people took valley people in. The stories were pretty much the same up and down the valley. When the water went down, the agricultural world and the culture in the valley began to rapidly change. Controversy about flood control broke out. Tempers flared. Large dams on the tributaries were proposed. Large signs warned of Big damn foolishness. My dad thought the valley belonged to the river, but my siblings, all older than I, were progressive. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was ready. Soldier Creek behind our fields was straightened and levees built. No trees along the creek now. No more swinging out over the creek on grapevines. Dams were built on the major contributors to the call. Towns that would be flooded in, the, in those tributaries were moved. Also so were graveyards. That memorable half decade after the war was over in a flash. The horses nearly all gone. No more close questioning by me of the hired hands. Soldiers returned from Germany. I relentlessly tried to get details about their wounds and battles. Would, would, they would, st and would stop hoeing to question. They kept hoeing. One told me what he and others did to some Germans just captured. They told them to run. They did, and the Africa and the Americans mowed them down. My brothers had been in the Pacific. They would not talk about the war to me. It was clear that I talked too much. And if you talk too much while hoeing, you miss weeds. Get sloppy, especially on the leads, weeds within rows. You might not cut the root deep enough. You might use the point on the hoe too much. Better to stop and pull the quack grass. Grasp it at the ground, wiggle and shake. And when a brother drops back and comes behind you in your row to catch what you missed, well, you have been disciplined without a word spoken. Talk about the Germans or about other matters that I thought of mutual interest stopped. 
at least for a while. I've been talking about changes and was the speed of change out of ordinary. After all, the entire region, valleys and hills had been changing from the time of early settlement. Family lore confirms formal history back to 1854 when the Kansas-Nebraska Act made Kansas a territory. Two great-grandparents arrived that year, met and married. In 1856, 80 years before my birth, 50 miles southeast of that farm, south of Lawrence, near Baldwin, there was an engagement that from our distant perspective amounted to little more than comic opera. On June 2nd, John Brown with a small group of men defeated a small group of pro-slavery men at Blackjack on the Santa Fe Trail. This counter has been recognized as the first battle between abolitionists and the pro-slavery men. My great-grandfather, homesteading in that area, was with Brown that day. A few year later, years later, he bought the farm where the battle was fought. It was mostly prairie. And what did he do? He planted sugar, a sugar maple grove from which he harvested syrup. And on this tall grass prairie, he also planted over 600 trees. Like most immigrants, as Wendell Berry put it, he came with vision, but not with sight. He came with visions of former places, but not the sight to see where he was. The California Trail, including Mount Oriad in Lawrence, was tall grass prairie all the way. Trees were along the Wakarusa, and of course the call. And except where the crops and mostly cool season grass pastures are now, it's eastern deciduous forest, a forest that encroaches westward into grassland well over 100 miles now, partly because of agriculture, partly because of poor livestock management, partly because of climate. But I'm ahead of my sequence. And now another place. We're moving out of the Kansas River Valley and we are going north and west into South Dakota. We're going to Valentine, Nebraska and we're going 50 miles north into South Dakota to a little place called White River. In June 1952, a century after the Battle of Black Jack, my 16th summer, I went to the prairies of South Dakota to work on a ranch belonging to a childless couple. Ina, an eccentric first cousin of my mother, and her equally eccentric Swedish immigrant husband, Andrew Swan, were in their 60s and 70s by then, and their land acreage somewhat between three and 4,000. They lived north of White River. South is the Rosebud Reservation and to the west, Pine Ridge. That summer I encountered the pitiful reality of Native Americans and the contrasting ideas of the many immigrant ranchers about their purpose in life. Mostly Scandinavian, they too came with vision, but not with sight. To their credit, they learned in a hurry that most of that area was best used for grazing by the bovine. Some natives on Saturday came to town in buckboards, pulled by a team, more often in pickup trucks. Their bovine grazer, the bison, was gone. I was mostly ignorant of where I was in historical time, nor did I know the word worldview. I wish I had been more aware, because on those dusty streets of White River, I must have exchanged glances with older natives who, as children or young adults, witnessed the massacre at Wounded Knee. Some of them must have had relatives at the Battle of the Little Bighorn 76 years earlier. The major gift to me was to live in a land of mostly native prairie and perhaps an early seed for our own work here now. It was there that I got my first intimate engagement with a landscape featuring a vegetative structure determined more by nature's ecology 
than by a people's culture. Even though the bison had been replaced some 80 years earlier by their domestic bovine relatives from Europe, the land was less disturbed by human tinkering than most landscapes appropriated for human food. Ina was Andrew's second wife. His first had been Ina's sister, Bertha. Andrew and Bertha homesteaded one half section and Ina another. When Bertha died after a 20-year marriage, Andrew, Swan, and Ina Stover married, joined their holdings, and continued to add land. On some Sundays, I rode horses over those prairies with two teenage brothers whose father was known as a half-breed. They told me of adventures wildly unfamiliar, both their own, they had roped a deer, and out of their parents and grandparents. They pointed to a hill where their end end grandfather had trapped eagles. Did he want the feathers to propitiate the fates? On Saturday, Andrew, Ina, and I would go to White River as close as anything to a real frontier town that still exists. Some of the rosebed Sioux would lie in the shade of the stores, and as the sun moved, they would gather belongings and move to the shade on the other side. Out on the ranch, Andrew would cuss and swear when I asked questions about the natives being removed from their land. He let me know that Indians never did anything with the land. In town, an Indian from whom Andrew and Ina were leasing land regularly charged groceries to their account. Andrew always paid, for failure meant that a neighboring rancher would be only too willing to lease the land next year, perhaps forgetting that he too would be trapped into buying a bottle of whiskey and that he too would have to tolerate come upon what was left of one of his steers butchered by the same redskins. That prairie landscape was mostly unplowed and still is today. The horse, then central to life, is less so now. And out on Ina and Andrew's ranch, Besides the moon and stars, the only lights were dim ones from the towns of Murdo and Okaton across the river, 12 to 15 miles distant. It was a summer of branding, cast raiding, fence riding, dens of rattlesnakes to discover and fear, and of pond bass to catch. Many evenings on the ranch, I'd drive out on the point, a flat high place to shoot prairie dogs, or see the hundred head of Andrew's horses on the range or among the trees along the river. Andrew kept them by contending that horse trading had made it possible for him to be so solidly positioned. Today, I think of the slack that Andrew and I enjoyed to be able to afford those mostly unbroken horses grazing the unbroken prairie. Lewis and Clark's Missouri River is only 50 miles from White River. Little of Jefferson's vision of the yeoman farmer was ever possible there. On those prairies, the land determined what could be done if humans were to stay. Some tried to farm the upland flats, but mostly failed. I loved everything about that country. The Indians, the rodeos, the rattlesnakes from a distance, the Danish and Swedish immigrants, some with heavy accents, but all delighted with their land holdings. I love the way the natives got a little bit even with the butchered steer, the grocery bill, and the whiskey. And so the botanical contrast. In the Kansas River Valley, hoeing was endless. The ensemble of our crops would change every year, but on the ranch, I did not miss what I enjoyed on the farm. Whether it was watermelons, sweet potatoes, cantaloupes, strawberries, peonies, sweet corn, potatoes, tomatoes, rhubarb, asparagus, and more, all required hoeing. <laughs> From that, it was a relief to put up alfalfa hay, harvest wheat, or dig potatoes. The contrast between that truck, gra truck, grain, and hay farm and the South Dakota ranch could not have been sharper. We were alone on the ranch most of the week. At our roadside market near Topeka, 
And when people came out from town to pick strawberries, our family met and talked with many people and not just from Topeka and surrounding areas, but also travelers. None of the so that socializing compared to the life of the grassland which supported natives, ranchers, and rodeos. And what burned in me during my youth were two experiences with land. What became noted later to me as the Jeffersonian agrarian ideal where culture dictated that land, ground be plowed, worked and planted, and range land life where the plow had no place. It was even an anathema. I preferred the grassland. One of my grandfathers arrived in Kansas in 1877. With a small inheritance, he threw himself out on the Flint Hills west of Topeka to run cattle on more or less free grass. At the end of 10 years, he had enough to go in with a partner and purchase 160 acres of Sandy Loan in the Kansas River Valley, where I was born. I wondered why that grandfather purchased the farm given that grass had been so good to him. Why give up on that way of life? It has taken me decades to acknowledge the power of culture and regional history, the power of a world view, that term I had never heard until college. My grandfather was born and raised in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, a Virginian, an agrarian. The ideal of the family farm as a source of virtue for the yeoman farming, farmer had a history long before Jefferson championed it. Nevertheless, when thinking about the agrarian ideal, I could not resist looking at my road atlas and finding my grandfather grew up less than 50 miles as the crow flies from Jefferson's Monticello. Because of the history of that worldview, going back at least to the Greeks and Hebrews, the meaning of that distance in space is far less significant. Jefferson praised the small farmer from a cultural influence likely beyond books. Much later, I finally had the language to understand and describe how on the South Dakota ranch, ecological determinism is the major factor. How the land, not humans, determined plant behavior. On those South Dakota prairies, west of the Missouri, if the original vegetative structure is plowed, a steep reduction in carrying capacity will sh shortly follow. In the Kansas River Valley, historical determinism rules, and Jefferson's ideal can be a reality at least for a while. South Dakota requires grazing. The Jeffersonian ideal can exist longer in eastern Kansas because of soils and rainfall, a more forgiving landscape, and across the continent ranges an ecological mosaic between and beyond these two places. So what is to be made of this story, these two stories? Changes in my lifetime. Yes, the Kansas River Valley has few truck farms now. It was local, largely organic and seems unlikely to return now that it is dominated by corn and soybeans. The industrial mind has taken over, and so what are we to do? I'm going to argue for the next few minutes that help is coming from two shifts in consciousness, but they will need help. There may be a cosmic shift spreading right now, and an earlier conceptual shift increasingly to take hold. Both, both are ba based on verifiable information. There is a story to be told. Two contrasting worlds on the same continent at the same time the Kansas River Valley truck farm, close to the state capital at Topeka. I looked out of my bedroom window every morning and saw that capital. A few feet away, a paved national highway system that would carry any truck or car 
coast to coast, provided it had no serious mechanical limits, that agricultural system went down in spite of local and national traffic. The White River Ranch is still operating, though perhaps the population of the town has gone down some. Our land-grant college, 50 miles away to the west, sent agronomists to our farm many times. We would say, down from the college. And they came there to other valley farmers as well. And we also had the county agent. The men from the college all wanting to be helpful. What happened? Our country has had secretaries of agriculture, one saying, get big or get out. Another saying, plant fence row to fence row. Agricultural economists, e economics became a big thing in rural areas. What seems to run ahead of all else is that agricultural policy is a derivative of the availability of highly dense fossil carbon. We tend to think that we are responsible for policy when I think it's clear that the policy comes with possibility. This is the imperative. Carbon has always held over organism, usually unwittingly. You see, that truck farm with 20 crop species and weed species was an information-poor farm, biologically speaking. It was an information-rich farm culturally. You got it? In other words, take the DNA of all those crops. Spread it out. That's information. There's the cultural information. So if you got that part, so it was an information-rich farm culturally, but combine the information embedded within the DNA of all those creatures plus those underground in the soil, it was information poor. Compared to the information richness of the South Dakota ranch, which is very rich biologically, but very little information to bring to the ranch to create a harvest for the couple. There were good ranches, but most of the information was in the DNA of nature's prairie. The Kansas River Valley farmers brought lots of cultural information to their fields with the help of professionals, but still that system failed to near extinction in my lifetime. So when I see such words as confinement, vertical integration, foreign ownership, egg chemicals, seeds, genetics, decline of family farms, the effect of the beef packing industry for cow-calf farms, what's the problem? Social injustice, aggregations of power, or ecological damage, erosion, and chemicals? Yes, but no, we can't say no to highly dense carbon, and that comes at a cost to information. Something is deeply wrong. We need new ways of thinking. And so let's look at the whole system. The Ecosphere Studies is a new reference point for us. And so, uh, a key word at the core of eco-studies is the word ecocentrism, which in the words of J. Stan Rowe is as follows. Ecocentrism is a way of thinking. It proposes an ethic whose reference point is supra human, above and outside humanity. 
It places the health of the ecosphere before human welfare. It points the way to solving questions that without humanistic or biocentric frameworks are virtually unsolvable. The economic growth problem, the population problem, the abortion choice problem, the technology problem, it gives new and constructive direction to philosophers, economists, scientists, and engineers. That's in Stan Rowe's Earth Alive, to which we add new and creative directions to the arts and humanities. And then this, embedded within that ecocentric, comes from Aldo Leopold. And what this means for us in a somewhat more operational sense has always been well described, but this time by Leopold, and here he is. And by the way, he also said that nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. Rather, it evolves in the minds of a thinking community. And only the most naive student of history actually believes that Moses wrote the Decalogue. What he did was summarize an already existing ethic for a seminar. <laughs> so here's Leopold. All ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in that community. Instincts competing for his place in that community. But his ethics prompt him also to cooperate, and he says parenthetically, perhaps in order that there may be a place to compete for. <laughs> The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and the animals of collectively the land. So I want to draw a long breath here and see where we are in time. And what time am I to quit? Five minutes. Five minutes. I'll be done in 50. <laughs> uh, not really, Rachel. It's all right, sit down. It's okay, Rachel. Okay. We're, here's, here's where I think we can bear down. We're living in a time where a cosmological shift in our thinking is happening. It's a shift based on verifiable information from the astrophysicists with help from the ordinary physicists who have been learning in increasing detail of our cosmic origins in that journey from the Big Bang to the present. The story is sufficiently complete that a new framing has shaped up with a history which allows us to set stakes at various points in the journey from the Big Bang to the formation of elements, stars, planets, galaxies, and more. That's a cosmological shift. It's not, you think of the time of Jesus of Nazareth. It was a two-sphere world. There was the earth and there was heaven. And they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have the internet. And so they had to rely on angels. <laughs> That, <laughs> that carried information back and forth. <laughs> Odd-looking creatures, they were part like us and part bird. Uh, I mean, I get that out of having checked out the Renaissance and the Reformation and all such things. So uh, um, that, that's, we got a cosmological shift now. We now know where we come from. We're stardust. We're products of a dying star. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the next 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we're also 
involved yet in a concept, conceptual shift. There's a difference between a cosmological shift, I think, than a conceptual shape, shift, and I'll probably get taken to task on that at lunch. <laughs> Embedded within the cosmological story, but told much earlier in 1859, is a conceptual, not cosmological, but conceptual revolution in biology. It comes from Darwin's great insight and in the work of the ecologist and evolutionary biologist who followed. They remain busy today, so much so that we now have a good handle on our earthly origins, embedded within our cosmological journey, and it's a great time to be alive and had such verifiable knowledge that two of our old religious questions have been answered. Where do we come from? What kind of a thing are we? We know that now with verifiable information. The third old religious question, what's to become of us, is as far as creaturely life is concerned, well, largely be up to us. So this new knowledge of our cosmic and earthly origins has the potential to give us direction. Pondering our framework with its limits and opportunities to build within that framework will require radical change. It means nothing less than changing our industrial minds to an ecological worldview. Much, if not most, of that conceptual shift will come from two sources based on this information. So here we are, early in the 21st century. We no longer live in a two-sphere world. We know that from the time of Copernicus in the 1500s, who began the change in our story, there have been several conceptual revolutions already. Copernicus replaced Ptolemy. Newton replaced Descartes. Lavoisier's oxygen theory replaced Stahl's phlogiston theory. Darwin's insight replaced divine creation. Einstein's relativity and quantum theory replaced Newtonian physics. And most recently, plate tectonics established the existence of continental drift. Those are all conceptual uh, uh, changes. So we've had, we've had this, this history. And now Mary Evelyn Tucker, uh, who was here a couple of years ago, her husband, um, uh, John, 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 Graham, Graham uh, and uh, Brian Swim have put together this project. It took them 10 years. And, uh, and they were drawing on the astrophysicist research. And uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, she calls this project the biggest story ever told. Now, it's important that she calls it story, because what she says is that if you note the process from the Big Bang to the present, you see that it's unfolding. If you look at the universe as a thing, that's stasis. But here is a process, and we are a part of it, and we have the opportunity to shape that effort, but it has to be in the context of the limits of this ecosphere, which, by the way, is alive literally. If you can imagine going inside a cell, making yourself small enough, so small that you have to have binoculars to look around, you'll see crystals. You say, that's not alive. You see some things doing this. Oh, that's alive. You step outside, but the whole cell is alive. Just so with the Earth. We've regarded the oceans as dead, except for the organisms there. We've regarded the atmosphere as dead. And we've regarded the lithosphere as dead. But the Earth is our creator. It's our maker. And with the upper atmosphere protecting the lower biosphere, it makes it safe. And so our maker defender and with proper restoration efforts, redeemer. You know the hymn? It's from a, the Psalm 121. 
with my little twist on it. <laughs> so a maker, a defender, a redeemer. We have no evidence that the earth loves us unless you're looking at the flowers and the beauty of it all and say, it must love us. Look how much we appreciate it. But we don't have data. But we have data that it's our maker. <laughs> and we have data that's our defender. And we have data it can be our redeemer. And so here we are at a point in which with a new cosmology and a new conceptual framework for us, we can begin to think about that Kansas River Valley and what it will require of us. And we can think just as the folks in South Dakota, the ranchers, they had to know what was required of them if they were going to stay. A lot of racism up there, a lot of meanness, but in terms of the treatment of that grassland, they know not to plow it. And they may not be thinking this is an information rich world that therefore does not require a lot of highly dense energy. So as I see it, the problem of the modern world, but the problem began, I think, when we began to get at the young pulverized coal of the soil through plowing, through agriculture. And that gave us this surplus. And then 5,000 years ago, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, they cut the forests in, of, in the cedars of Lebanon. I calculated it's about two-thirds the size of Kansas if what I read that was cut from that forest and the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh talks all about that and how that happened. Um, and then, so those two pools, the soil carbon, the, fossil, uh, the, the forest carbon to smelt the ore for the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and then the coal and oil and natural gas. So we have this dense energy available and it goes back to us all being carbon based starting 3.45 billion years ago, that carbon atom with its four different places it can join, it's a nice atom. <laughs> but that, that carbon imperative, we never had to worry about whether we could take in too much. We don't have that built within. That has to come as an acknowledgement that this is the problem. I don't want to have to hoe like I did as a kid. I don't mind hoeing a little bit in a garden. Um, I don't want to have to constantly be on guard environmentally saying no to concentration of feedlots, saying no to vertical and horizontal integration with the Tysons and so on. We've got to get straight what we want, predicated upon this cosmological worldview, this conceptual worldview, and an acknowledgement that it's the carbon imperative that is our undoing. Let's put a cap on it. Let's ration it. Rationing wasn't that bad. I learned to read during rationing, of, you know, reading the signs to save tires, drive under 35. So, I'm going to quit only because Rachel's back there and she's fuming around and so on. And also, I've said enough. I'm so glad that you folks are here. And I'm so appreciative of your support of the Land Institute. And you just got to keep on coming back. <laughs>